Probably one of the most asked questions is what is the perfect training split? It depends on the, the training method that you want to use, right? You know, I love antagonist supersets, which anyone that doesn't know that is, is you know, you one muscle group and then the opposite muscle group in a superset fashion. What's your thoughts on four day split sets? For me, a four day split is where it's at. That's what I want everyone to do if possible. If we're looking at the key things that we need to think about when it looks to getting the best training split for you, what are the things you need to take into consideration? Because we're doing less work, but higher intensities, I like to get chest, back, shoulders, and arms in one workout twice a week. Yeah, I, I love that. I don't think there's necessarily more to say on that split. That's pretty much what I do. If someone's going to be deadlifting, they may they may not want to be doing that. You know, if they're really strong, they may not want to be doing that every five days, right? By the time I get to that third chest exercise, I'm lifting such a little amount of load that my overall training volume has suffered. So, Steve, probably one of the most asked questions of any fitness professional from anybody who is into the gym already is what is the perfect training split now before we go into our opinions are on this like firstly how important do you feel the training split is in the grand scheme of things of program design <laughs> Uh, well, it, I think it's one of the most important things because you know what I mean we've got to know how many days people have got to play with you know what I mean? Me and you might have five days a week, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week to train. Other people, busy lives, kids, family, work, etc. They may only have three days to play with. So that's, as you know, it's the most important thing, isn't it? How many days you got to play with? Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things that's both like overemphasized and underemphasized at the same yeah. time, because the actual split to me isn't actually that important as regards to overall volume. But once you've got yeah. overall volume, we need to go, well, how do we divide this between the days to make sure that we can, and because volume is sets times, sets times load, right? So if we, if our split's not good, the amount of load we're going to lift goes down, the amount of training volume goes down. So it actually becomes quite an important thing, although the over focus on this and the actual split itself doesn't really matter as long as you achieve fitting in that volume, in my opinion. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Um, I think, you know, obviously hitting volume, hitting the right amount of sets, working sets on a muscle group is important for building muscle, etc. So, you know, the volume, yeah, you're right. Number one. And then, you know, how do you distribute that across the week? Or, you know, a five day cycle, which we'll go into or a seven day cycle or whatever, you know? Yeah, there was a great video from Ben Yanes. If you know, do you know Ben Yanes? Yep. Yeah, so he did this great video. For people who don't know him, he's a guy who talks a lot of exercise mechanics online. He did the perfect training split in a short. I thought it was brilliant. And I think this actually has a translatable thing to anything in life, right? He put this graph, and on the x-axis, he put the words find out. And on the y-axis, he put fuck around. And basically saying yeah. the best perfect split is from the more you fuck around, the more you find out. Which yeah, I that, that was... There was a there was a guy that did a did a funny video about that some old geezer and he, he had it drawn up didn't he and then a, a lot of people have used that statement analogy or whatever it is to explain what, things. What's yeah, the old guy? Was we should talk about how crazy women were? Who Ben Haynes or? No, no, yeah, the sorry. original person yeah, in this yeah, graph. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. The more you, yeah, the more you fuck around. Yeah, it was all about women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so like. Going into like breaking this apart, right? If we're looking at the key things that we need to think about when it looks to getting the best training split for you, what are the things you need to take into consideration? Obviously, how much time the person has to train, so preference. But what else? Yeah, um, certainly experience. You know what I mean? Like, for example, if someone's going to be deadlifting, they may they may not want to be doing that. You know, if they're really strong, they may not want to be doing that every five days right or every four days they may want to do it once every 10 days or something you know as an extreme advanced example muscle groups that they want to build injuries you know can they load a specific muscle a specific joint if they do it too often they may just get a little bit too much inflammation if they got niggles pains um you know things like that so those are things to consider um recovery how well do people recover so um training age things like that as well um, what else? What what can you think of? There's just a few things I've just rattled off there. Yeah, the things I've jotted down a list here is obviously like obviously preference, as you mentioned before. So like, how many days do they have to train? What do they like in a split? Right? Because like a lot, 
a lot of the times the split comes to not just about how many days you can train, but if someone just hates training full body, then we, we can throw out full body splits entirely, right? Yeah. If someone hates training, hates having an arm day because it doesn't feel significant or likes having an arm day because they like getting a pump, right? These things generally all matter. Like for, for often when I look at, like when I do like an upper lower split, which we'll get into in a second, I often do like, and this is an example of preference, upper, lower body and arms, rest, upper, lower body and arms. And the reason I do this is because, particularly with guys, right, they're not, they're gonna, if they're going to miss a day, they're going to miss leg day. So if I put their arms on leg day, then they're less likely to miss leg day because then they also don't get to train arms. So tell me that split again. Upper body. Upper body. Lower body and arms. Rest. Low upper body, body and lower body and arms. And the arms will always be single joint stuff that's easy to recover from. It won't be like dips and chins and stuff like that because... Yeah, well, so you, then, then you'll be impacting the upper body days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool, cool. I mean, you know, like, and it, it also depends on the, the training method that you want to use, right? You know, I love antagonist supersets, which anyone that doesn't know that is, is you know, you one muscle group and then the opposite muscle group in a superset fashion, popularized by Charles Poliquin, Ian King in the 90s. But, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger used to use that stuff as well, you know? Um, opposite muscle sort of groups. Um, you know, what does it do? You know, increase training density so you get more work done in a, a short amount of time. Um, you know, increased motor unit recruitment. The science is clear that, you know, if you work one muscle, then work the opposing muscle, you can get a better contraction in that muscle group. Decreased performance drop off curves as well. So, you know, there's a, there's a, a slower rate to fatigue um, and things like that. So I love antagonist supersets i love chest and back a lower body rest shoulders and arms and then i love another lower body session to finish off the week on a friday and then they can have the weekend off that's how i like to run yeah. it so if we're going into that that sort of like uh antagonist agonist superset right i mean, just this is a slight tangent but i'm just interested like is there a bell curve in the effectiveness of it because the way i would think is that training the opposing muscle group like yes we can put aside like density of the workout get more done in less time right but if let's say for sake of argument i'm training biceps and also training triceps the muscle group on the opposing side will help stabilize and create almost like a counter force for the other for the muscle we're trying to train so the tricep will help stabilize make sure we get more out of the bicep if we're pairing them together but is there an element here where as that starts to fatigue we now lose stability and in turn we lose contractile force because our opposing muscle anchoring things is a bit fucked. Yeah, I think potentially. Yeah, obviously. I mean, you know, one of the good things about antagonistic supersets is I, I believe that you get a bit of pump as well. So if we're doing an arm day superset, a bicep curl and a tricep extension, maybe there is a little bit more of a, of a pulling effect in the arm and then it makes it harder to hit that next exercise. So, can that be beneficial? Yeah, if we're looking from a sort of, um, you know, a damage perspective and, a, and, a, and a, a lactate accumulation perspective, fatigue perspective, you know, a pump in the muscle. Um, but, you know, do we want to have that early on in the session? Maybe not. So maybe we do want to split those muscle groups up in the session if we're going to do, you know, opposing muscle groups. But then there's, you know, you can say, all right, maybe we should put it on a different day. Hmm. Is there muscle groups mm. that you would never superset? Is there, is there an exercise you would never have an antagonist agonist superset? Well, one thing I wouldn't do is is is, is superset a squat and a deadlift. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. You'll make sure there's no interference, right? Yeah, yeah, no interference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's a funny one because I remember one of my you know I remember being at Ultimate Performance with you and I was doing a training session, I was doing a squat and then I was going straight into a glute ham raise. And one of the coaches said to me, you shouldn't be doing that because you're gonna fatigue the lower back. You're gonna get too much fatigue. Your squat's gonna be shit, blah, blah, blah. And um, it made me think, yeah, you're right. But also at the same time, as, as we know, you know, there's no wrong or right time, like sort of programming. Like, what am I doing? What's the goal? You know, I might have been squatting a lightweight, a technical set, you know, working on my technique, my position, long time at the tensions. So really, as long as you can justify what you're doing as a coach, 
there's you know there's no good or bad way to program as long as you have a good reason for it you know what i mean like i you know what i mean yeah what do you think yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. i think the the biggest thing whenever i've mentored coaches like i don't really mind what you do in your program design as long as you have a why like i'm there are there are absolutely rules to program design 100 percent. but rules are yeah. meant to be broken and if you can break those rules with a good enough reason to break them then i then i'm totally on board with it for example Luke Lehman popularized a training, uh, training modality called backloaded structural balance, where instead of doing your remedial stuff at the end of the workout, where people just kind of go home, lose intensity, kind of forget about it, we put the remedial stuff at the start. So let's say we did a couch stretch into to open up the rec bem, going into a split squat. Then we do a dead bug or a bracing drill into the incline hyper to think about anchoring that pelvis. And then we go into a lighter pause, sort of more um, technique-based squatting pattern. So we're now kind of going, right, we've got everything fired up around that pelvis. Now let's drop into the squat. That and goes honestly, against the rules. Of... Go on. Yeah. And, no, I was just going to say, and, and that's a style of, of programming that I absolutely love. And, and what a fantastic term, to, like, what a fantastic way to call, call it, like what a brilliant name to call it. Yes. You know what I mean? That's a brilliant name to call it. And when you think about it, though, like how do you warm up before – an upper body session. You know what I mean? How, how do you warm up a client before an upper body session who has, you know, you know, bad knees or patellar tendonitis or a dodgy lower back or, you know, tight internal rotators. Yeah. You do some form of, you might do some rolling and you might do some proprioception, stability, strength work, whatever system you want to use, you'll use that maybe to prep them before the session. You know what I mean? Luke Lehman's just coined, giving it a term and, and, Say, so, oh, this is how we can actually program. You know what I mean? Yeah, and and we when we look at that as well, like it, it it breaks those rules because like you think like the biggest indicator lift, the biggest most complex lift at the start, and then you have the most simple thing at the end. And I think that generally is the rule. And if you've got a client that lacks skill, then you wouldn't even touch things like backload the structural balance. But if you have a more exactly. like, intermediate advanced trainee with some length tension issues, no full well, right? Even if he loves training, that. D series exercise is going to fall by the wayside in terms of mental fortitude and intensity compared to when he's fresh in the gym, ready to squat. So flip these round. And then what he always used to do is like, let's say you have the A squat and the C series, then he moves it to the B series and then puts some actual traditional accessory hypertrophy work in. Then he'll move it to the A series and you're back to original program where you now can start loading up that squat again and then change the accessories to more, less remedial work, more uh, hypertrophy work. Right, like, and that works fantastic. Just to play devil's advocate, though, with that as well, mm. like, there, there, we go. there we go. <laughs> but also this, right? I'm sure you do as well. Beginners that come in, all right. You give them a side plank; they can't hold it for 20 seconds. Yeah. All right. So what about a 15-second, 10-second side plank and then, you know what I mean, something else and something else and something else as their warm-up prep work? <laughs> They're not even squatting yet. But, I mean, that's the big part of their workout. Like, why do you need to put it at the end? Why can't we put it at the beginning just to teach them some sort of isometric stability work, teach them how to brace, engage, lock it in, scapula work whatever and then we go into the bigger stuff maybe then we go into a step up then we go into a goblet squat then we move into something a bit more aggressive and, and bigger compound based again could, can we call that structural backloading um why not potentially yeah I mean, potentially of the other right. clients that i work with sorry the 60 to 80 year olds we do that all the time i told you before i sometimes get them doing the cardio two minute interval sets with a minute recovery three times <laughs> Then they go into their mobility, then they go into to their stability, and then we might only have 10 minutes, and then we do some like goblet squatting and pull downs, and then see you later. Mm. Yeah, I, I love that because, because again, yeah, it's like it's breaking down these really complex skills that people often think are beginner skills, right? The amount of people that give walking lunges to beginners drive me around the bend, right? And you show what's the individual components? What do I need to the ankle? What do I need to the hip? And if I could do all these things individually, it's going to be much easier to integrate these things. So, like, I definitely think preference and then this sort of like where somebody's at in terms of whether that's length tension issues whether we do sort of back structural balance needs to be in play a needs analysis 
So that's like, right, what body parts do you need to bring up? What strength goals you particularly want to bring up? So if it's strength focus, what's the reason why your bench press is sticking? If it's a physique focus, what muscle parts do you need to add balance? Like, I always think you are as big as your smallest body part. So if you look at me from the side, you realize my biceps are bigger than my triceps because I've got quite good genetic attachments to my biceps. So you can go, okay, so... Simon's triceps make his biceps and back look smaller. Simon's back and biceps does not make Simon's triceps look bigger, right? So we probably need to prioritize these things more. I would say um, the recovery capabilities and experience, you can sort of put hand in hand because if somebody's recovery is poor, let's say they're in a stressful period of their life, they do shift work, whatever, they might be able to train as frequently as someone that can't. And as small as advanced as someone gets, like the reason I often change a training split from like a full body program is that someone gets good at training and they get more of the individual sets. Eventually, hitting chest on a Monday and hitting that same exercise on a Wednesday, they will probably be too sore to really get the most from it. That's when I will then give them more rest time, but then add a training day to go to a four-day split so we can still get the amount of sets that we need per week yeah. which is my last thing i need to consider is the, how many sets do you we need per week to grow which really are some guidelines with to start you off but which is normally around about 10 to 25 sets per week normally give or take depending on the on the muscle group but like from that it's like well it's going to be individual per the person so the split will evolve as you go through and go you know simon my chest doesn't recover as well as my back okay we'll do less sets of chest more sets on back and then we find that perfect split over time. And this is it, like, you know, like what constitutes as a set? And then how do we put, what method are we using? All right. Because then that will dictate, you know, the massive, you know, hormonal response that we get from our training split, right? You know, are we using, you know, I mean, it's, you know, we said earlier, we don't do a squat and a deadlift superset, you know what I mean? Back to back. But, but some people do, you know what I mean? They might do a big, I don't know what you call it, like a big death set, you know, like a big um, circuit, circuit of, you know, a death circuit, of course. You But you, you might do front squat, back squat, heels elevated squat, box squat. I don't know. I just made that up, yeah? It's all squatting. You know, you might, you might do sets of six, 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 or 10, 10, 10, 10. Sounds stupid. But for an intermediate to advanced trainee, they can do that. You know what I mean? They're yeah. technically proficient. They're ready for it. You've built – and this is the key, I think, Sai. Like we as coaches and everybody else, we always look at programs and what people do on a session and say, oh, that's stupid. That's dumb. Why are you doing that for? You should be training like that. But we don't know the annual journey of that client, the yearly journey, the monthly, how they built to that. Now, yeah. if they've done some, if they've just done a 6, 12, 25, then a 10 by 10, then a fucking G, you know, advanced GBT and then a GBC, it's all over the place. You know, they, 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 they're just, and we, you know, I probably did that when I was young trying all these different training methods, putting them all together, never really getting anywhere, working hard, but never really going anywhere. So we don't understand. Uh, sorry, sometimes we don't see the picture of where people are in it, in their training journey. So if someone is doing fucking front squats into deadlifts, into back squat, into snatch grip RDLs, it looks stupid to us, but they might have prepped for that. They might have been training towards that. And if they've been training properly towards that with progressive overload, control, recovery, good nutrition, proper training techniques, then why not? Why can't they do it? The rules are there I, to be broken. A hundred percent. And I think we do this as a, without going off on too much of a tangent, I think we do this as an industry in general, right? How many coaches you go, this coach is stupid, client was on 1,200 calories. And you go, well, okay, maybe they're two weeks out from a photo shoot. Maybe... They, over the last six months, your trainers realized that this client is intentionally lying to them about how much they're eating and they're under-reporting their calories. So he's now adjusted the, or she, has adjusted this client's calories to lower on paper it's 1,200 because they know the client's actually hitting 16, 17, 1,800. So if, I, if they put them at 1,600, they're on 2,500. So we only see what's on paper. We only, and we don't see where it come from. We don't see the backstory. And I think that's super important. Um, training and nutrition, obviously. Everything. Yeah, yeah, everything. Everything. It's the same, it's the same thing with training splits, right? And I think, like, if, if, if someone's looking at this and going, oh, well, I, you know, I like death circuits. The way I always looked at a death circuit, and this was actually, I remember doing my first death circuit as a, ever, like coaching one. 
um, not trading one, but coaching one, was when I covered your client, uh, Bob, where you had, uh, talk about a training split, you had two full body workouts and then a death circuit on a Saturday. And, and I remember it was just very modified. So you had sort of like a, you had a barbell hip thrust, you had a squat, you had a press and a, some form of pull. And I, and I it got me thinking about how you can modify these death circuits. And like for, for, if people have got gyms that allow it, I'm a very big fan of well, what is the priority lift? What's the priority upper? What's the priority lower in the four? So let's say you want to work on a deadlift and you want to work on a bench press. I'll go deadlift, bench press, but I won't then go um, back squat, chin up. I'll go prone row, goblet squat, for example. So now I can have something that, one, it'd be easier to fit in their gym because they can stay around that one bench. But two, we can, have, we can focus on the one and then have a slightly more stable one as the second. If you want to focus on the squat, I may go a hip thrust or an RDL or, so, or a leg curl or something a little bit easier on that second uh, exercise. And then maybe your next yeah. phase is switching it. And then maybe your third phase is integrating them. And that's when you get to that point where that client's like, that looks stupid. But then you go, that's where we've come from. We've worked yes. on each individual component, then the progression is bringing them all together. Yes, and that's it, man. Like, I don't know where I was, maybe you put it up. Our, we can adapt to anything, you know what I mean? Our bodies are very smart and they can adapt to, you know, anything that we give it. You know what I mean? Whether that's nutritionally, calories, supplements, stress, um, training, our bodies will adapt somehow. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, same for same, same for training. So going into the splits themselves, what are your preferred, and give a few options here, three-day training split? Um, for a three-day training split, for someone who's advanced, I like, um, you know, and strong. So we go um, chest and arms. Yeah. Then they do a leg workout. Then they have a day off, and then they do a back and shoulder workout. Mm-hmm. Why that? And then off. I just find you know what if they're advanced, if they're very strong, they're maybe doing lots of lots of volume, lots of work, lots of sets, heavy ass loads. I like to just have chest by itself, with and then elbow flexors, arms, and and triceps, elbow extensors, and then they're going to have a whole day um, by itself. Two days later um, of of back work, vertical pulls, horizontal pulls, back variations, and then shoulders as well. For me, it works really well for people that are more advanced. Mm. as opposed to sitting chest and neck on the same day, because that can be quite difficult for people that are strong. And like we said earlier, they get lots of pumps. They get maybe potentially more fatigue when they're super set in the same muscle group, um, you know, like such as chest and back or whatever. Um, yeah, go on. No, yeah, yeah. I know. I, 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 I like it. Like, I think for me, the only thing that differs is like, until, until we can't do this anymore, until like the recovery capabilities do not allow, I try to like to keep as much frequency as possible because the way I think on a three day split, it's like if I did um, say, well, buddy, a chest day, a uh, legs day and a back day. So I know that's a terrible split because we're missing a load of muscles, but just like, let's say I got a one is incline press, then flat press then decline press. By the time I get to that third chest exercise, I'm lifting such a little amount of load that my overall training volume has suffered. So if I can split that over the course of those three days by having more frequency, right? I can turn that light switch onto protein synthesis more often and potentially lift more low per session. Now, again, this depends on the beginning. If you're saying this isn't for an advanced training split, that person may um, not get more because they're fucked by the time they hit the second time. But I tend to like it where I go, keep a relatively full body training split if someone's training two to three days a week. And then what I do on that third day will depend on um, how advanced they are. So I, I often stop people with a full body where I go A, B. So it's like A, B, A, B, A, B. So we just alternate between two workouts. Yeah, like and then that. as someone gets more advanced, I'll either tailor it to um, either three full bodies or something like upper um, full body one, full body two target area. So guys will go full body yeah. one, full body two, upper body focus, maybe with one big, like a, maybe a big squat pattern at the start, like a one big lower lift and then all upper. And maybe girls will go full body one, full body two, posterior chain to get more glutes, yeah. hamstrings, lats, things like this. Yep. Yep. Love that. Yeah, no, that, that, that sounds good. And um, 
you know, I, I like that split as well, especially for females having that posterior day in there. And then for the males on that third day doing, um, you know, shoulders, chest, maybe some arms or whatnot, you know, shoulders, yeah. shoulders and chest or whatnot, uh, bringing up those muscle groups that they want to see come up, you know? Any, what's your thoughts on four day splits then? So we've gone through three. What's your preferred four day? I've got a few different options for this one. I, I, I vary when it gets to four. For me, a four day split is where it's at. That's what I want everyone to do if possible. I think it's where you're going to get optimal results, whether it's fat loss or building muscle or sport performance. Um, so what I like to do is keep it simple. We go super set. We go chest and back on a Monday. Tuesdays, a lower body workout, predominantly a squat pattern. Wednesday is a rest day or a recovery day or some steady state cardio or whatever. Uh, Thursday would be back to upper body, but this time we prioritize the shoulders and arms. And then the Friday will be a lower body again, but this time a little bit more posterior chain dominant. So we might have a deadlifting variation in there or maybe a trap bar and then a ton of posterior chain work. Yeah, that for me, especially for guys, that is my preferred four day split. Yeah, yeah, Almost yeah. identical. Yeah, it's a brilliant split. It's a brilliant split. And then <laughs> depending on what sort of method we're using, I might bring them down to a three day split where they may do, you know, chest and biceps and they may do a back and triceps and then they may do a leg day and then a little bit of shoulders sprinkled in across those other two days might rotate that across, you know, six days or whatever. Um, but generally speaking on the four day split, that's how it, that's how it will look when I go into a strength phase because I like undulating periodization, I will then go on Monday. I will do an upper body day one, which is chest, back, shoulders, arms. <laughs> Tuesday will be lower, which will be whole body squat focused again. Wednesday rest back to the upper. But this time we do, um, again, whole, whole upper. So it could be shoulders, arms, and chest and back. So it's pretty much because we're doing less um, work, but higher intensities, I like to get chest, back, shoulders, and arms in one workout hmm. twice a week. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely makes sense. Yeah, absolutely makes sense. Like, I am, um, yeah, I, I love that. I don't think there's necessarily more to say on that split. That's pretty much what I do. I think the one thing that I always think I add on, if people are watching this and as coaches and going like, well, that's great. How do I start to build this? A, a great tip that I, I heard for upper lower, generally works better on upper lower um, splits, but it can work on any four day split, really. This kilo strength, effort results, nice degree principle. So, if you, for sake of argument, what he found, because Stefan is ridiculous, the fact that he not only can, can periodize month on month, quarter on quarter, year on year, but he's now periodizing decade on decade now with his programs, which is mental. And he found from just training with so many athletes, you know, certainly in the intermediate to advanced category, because I, you know, I sometimes think these beginner programs are a bit only squat twice a week. I'm like, most beginners can't sit in the toilet without hurting themselves. Like, who are the beginners you get in Miami, Steph? Because I am very, very jealous. But he found that, let's say, 90 degrees in pressing angle was the sweet spot in terms of one being able to recover and have a good crossover to each other. So if you did a shoulder press and a high incline press, it's too close to actually be able to recover properly. Uh, and then if you go too far, like a shoulder press and a decline, it's too far away to have a crossover to one to help the other. So he periodized with incline press being on the same phase as decline presses and shoulder presses being the same phase as flat presses. So I always think of this when I come to building the, that upper lower split. Let's say on day one, I'm doing some form of a bench press or flat press variation. Then in my um, like B series, I might do a more stable 90 degree <laughs> press variation. So that could be a uh, machine shoulder press for example, right? Or um, seated pin press. Then on my upper body too, I might do a dumbbell shoulder press or a military press in my A, and then my B series would be a more stable flat press. Floor press, dumbbell press, machine press, something like this. And now we've got our main pressing exercises all locked in. In the same way, on the flip, on the reverse, on the um, posterior chain, I think like, we, we have this conversation whether should the shoulder stay back and down? With some people saying no, some people saying absolutely. I think this is very, very case dependent. If I'm under a one rep max bench press, you better fucking believe that I want my shoulders to stay back and down. 
because I want to be as stable as possible to shift the most load. But people look at it from a minute exercise perspective and not go, right, well, let's look at the program. So if my A series allows the shoulder blades to move, let's say a shoulder press, maybe I, I can get away with in my pulling superset something where the shoulders don't move as much or in my accessory or my B series something where it doesn't move as much. So let's say I've got a shoulder press where the scaps can move. Maybe now I'll do a neutral grip pull down or chin where I probably don't have as much movement in the scap. To a degree, if it's a chin, you still will, but not as much. And then my opposing work, I can have more locked in stuff in my B series. On the flip side of that, if I've got a bench press or something where I'm completely locked in on my A series, I may go pronated to get a bit more movement or range of motion from the scapula. I like that because over the course of a program, you're balancing movement with stability. Yeah, yeah, I like that idea. That's really cool. And, um, you know, what other exercises can you use from a pressing perspective that allows a shoulder blade to glide and move? McGill presses. Um, what are the presses with the bar on the floor? Which one? Oh, the landmine press. Landmine presses, McGill presses, um, you know, all those sort of things. Um, Any shoulder exercise. press variation, like a single arm kneeling yeah. shoulder press. Like we can put yeah. the list endless, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots of variations that you can play with here for sure. But I, I see, think, go on. That, no, no, no. I was going to say your split of the 90 degree principle, I always use that when I'm doing a four day split, but working in on a intensification strength phase. When I'm working on an accumulation volume stressing phase on a four day split, I don't follow that 90 degree principle. I do the opposite. I'll do a flat bench and then an incline press. And on day two, I'll do an overhead press, then a then a, then like a maybe an Arnold press as well. That's what I do. Mm. So you you're having those in the same workout. So you're like hammering one pattern on one day and then hammering the other pattern on the other day. Yes. Hmm. Interesting. Like I think going into other four-day splits that people can try, I think for girls, I really like a cross-body split. So it's like similar to like the upper-lower. I just find that when, if you go in from a full body, guys can't wait to stop the upper body, lower body supersets. And girls tend to like them. So I tend to go like quads with back. So like lower body push, upper body pull. Then lower body pull, upper body push. And I tend that seems to work well. Similar sort of split in terms of this, but we now just blend upper body and lower body together. I'll often use this also for guys that don't recover well for this same reason. Because even though you might think that's harder, super setting up a lower, there's very there's far less impact on recovery. As I said before, I think I found that it, when we do upper, let's say, chest and back, right, eventually the back gets so fatigued, it's going to be harder to stabilize our pressing movements, less so if we're doing a leg curl or an RDL or a hip thrust. So maybe going for those guys that struggle to recover, having that cross-body split tends to work well. And then my sort of last... Um, four day split I had down is a slightly more bridging the gap between intermediate to advanced but I really like this for hypertrophy is on day one do front body so ever like chest, delts quads etc right and this is maybe more for the more advanced person that maybe you might not want to superset you might just want to go in top set back of set move on to the next exercise second day back body rest and then on the last two days to get more frequency, we go target area one or target area two. So yeah. this could be front body, back body, quads and hams, shoulders and arms. Or it could be front body, back body, shoulders, I don't know, chest. Right? Like whatever the target areas are, so we can put this now, rather than having an even split of volume, we can now put some muscles on maintenance mode and we can hit on those first two days, like close to maintenance volume and everything. And then we can just tip some other stuff over the line into the higher ends of those volume landmarks. Just a quick one on that three-day split. That's like you just jogged my memory. That's something that I love to do. And actually, I do a lot with clients is day one will be lower body push, upper body pull. Day two will be lower body pull, upper body push. And day three, depending on who they are, what they want to work on and what phase we're in, it could be a death circuit, it could be some cardio, it could be a target muscle group or something like that. Yeah. So like, I think that, that's when we look at sort of four day splits. Now I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to move this away from for like whether it's three days or four days here for the last bit. Is there any advanced body part splits that you use? Now this could be more days, 
but it doesn't need to be. If you've got an advanced person, how would you then start to look at their training split? They may know a bit more about the training and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, well, um, I'll give you an example that I did. <laughs> training with John Meadows. Monday was okay. a chest and Monday was chest and shoulders. Lots of volume, seventeen sets or whatever it was, twenty sets, maybe it was more, thirty. Um, Tuesday was um, a back day all by itself. Wednesday was a leg day. Thursday was a arm day. And then a Friday, I got to choose two muscle groups and I had to follow the pro, like follow the exercises. So I chose them chest and shoulders again and then hit it again, then had the weekend off and then did it all over again across five days. So that was Mondays were chest and shoulders. Tuesdays was back. Wednesdays was legs, Thursdays was arms, Friday was an optional day on a, on a muscle group that you want to bring up, and mine was shoulders and chest. Different to the first day. I, I, think, I think John Meadows had a lot right. I think he was incredibly ahead of his time in terms of bodybuilding splits. And I, I like the idea of him having these optional super max pump days or sub max pump yeah, days yeah. where they're like, Brilliant. so you like, that almost when we're looking at five day splits or like more than four day splits every now and again i might divide the volume up as a four five days as a five six day split but what i'd probably more likely do is write my four day split and then give a couple of these optional pump days where with your rule is you don't take it to failure it's just sort of pump high rep technique work stuff like this and what i love about that is because for people that struggle with mobility issues Right, we can do our big length and range sort of work that's going to improve that mobility on our main four days. And on our other day, we're just getting blood flowing around the body, which I just don't think enough people do. We've become so sedentary. I know this. I've got I bought a treadmill for my home because I, I sit at the desk so much these days. So like I think we're so ahead of his time where I think some people overcomplicate four days uh, like five, six yeah. day splits. Yeah. Do your four day and have a non failure pump day on either target areas or as an overall non-eccentrically loaded thing so that whether that is a bodybuilding pump circuit or whether that is conditioning or cardio or things that don't impact recovery it doesn't need to be hugely complex yeah and and the cool thing about you know um that training split training with meadows was i mean you know very very high moderate to high volume lots of reps lots of light weights so it was great for my joints um i felt incredible i got very very fit from it and i just felt good every day you know like i felt really really healthy despite the amount of work that i was doing you know what i mean there's yeah. a ton of work ton of drop sets ton of fun intensity methods you know blood flow um restriction training chains um high reps drop sets um all different mechanical drop sets all funky exercises it was fantastic um but i felt i felt incredible I felt incredible um so the last thing i want to kind of go into when it comes to advanced training splits when somebody gets to that point where maybe you don't want to do an even split the rest of the way i think about it and shout out to a guy called Anthony jones who runs shapeshifters in birmingham for sort of talk like introducing me to this way of thinking about training splits which has really opened up my eyes to how you can truly personalize a split before my splits are very this is what the book says whether it's upper lower or cross body or these stray generic splits and rather than going right what's individual so let's say you've got your average week and we're going to do as a four day split as an example but you can modify this to whatever you need so make sure you do a needs analysis and you go right here are the muscles that we want to bring up the most here are the ones we want to put on maintenance mode so Let's say we're going to train Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday in this example. We're going to put the biggest target area. What do we want to train and then develop the most? We're going to put that next to the, to the day that has the most rest days following it so we can hit it hard and recover. So on Friday, let's say we want to bring up chest and shoulders, we put a push day. Chest and shoulders go on this day. And then let's say our second target area is, let's say, quads and back. For sake of argument, we'll put that on a Tuesday because it follows the rest day follows it. So where the recovery allows it, we put our biggest training days, 
And then on like Monday it. and Thursday in this example, we fill in the blanks. So that's yeah, now like a body that. part split. You may not do tons of frequency there, but you're using the ability to rest and the ability to drive volume on certain days more than others as your way to manipulate that volume. And I found that worked really well. And I think well, I used a four-day example there, but I think it works really well when you're working with more, like people who want to train five, six days a week. And it's like you can look at the case of, right, okay, if I wrote this on a whiteboard and I was doing exercise selection, where can I put volume and your target areas? Well, I'll put it next to your rest days and then go from there. Yeah, I like that. That's, that's, a, that's a very smart way of thinking. Um, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Have you used it? I've used it with myself and I've used it with a bunch of clients and it, work, it works well. Mm, but it's really well. And then a similar thing is now when I, when I do that four day split of front body, back body, target one, target two. That's why I came up with that split because it's sort of a halfway house between that totally personalized split and the stock approach because then I can sort of modify it. So if I've got front body, back body, um, target one, target two, let's say their chest is going to be the, the thing we're going to focus on. So then maybe I'll do back body on Monday, front body on Tuesday to have the rest period on Wednesday, whatever their second target area is, let's say it's hamstrings, and then chest on Friday to allow for that second rest period. So it's a bit more of a formal split, but then I will start to then play around with those days. And then on accumulation phases, I probably do the 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 more tailored one to two body parts a day sort of approach there because I'm going to be mm. hammering volume on my accumulation phases. I'm more likely to divide that volume up. And like, yeah. it, it was game changing for me because when I, um, like, like yourself, right, I study a lot of kilo strength stuff and I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of undulating periodization the why I do it slightly differently, I think to yourself. But I, I looked at this and I was like, and I go I see kilo. He's like, you do his program design course. And it's all sorts about upper lower splits and how to balance volume with upper lower splits. And then all these accumulation phases are these random body part splits. I'm like, and, and how have you come up with that? And I never had a way of coming up with that. And I was like, when I thought when this kicked in my head, I'm like, now I understand the difference. And that's then how I put it together now. Yeah, nice, nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, the guys at Kilo are fantastic um, training plans. Brilliant, brilliant. The way they put things together. I think, I think we close this episode off other, other than a shout out to us, we shout out to Kilo. Because I would say like, if, if, if and I'll go through mine first, but if we're going to talk about the best people to learn from other than us about program design in terms of periodization, I would probably look at Tom Hibbert from uh, Winning Strength. One of the, if you want to get, especially if you want to get insanely strong, one of the best program designers in the world. And Stefan Gasol from Kilo Strength. I then would probably throw in maybe if you want to get out more the bodybuilding group, maybe Kasim from N1 um, in terms of understanding how to periodize for bodybuilding. I think if you can learn from those three people, you cannot be a bad program designer. Who, what, yeah, who would I, you go to? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd certainly pick Kilo and Tom Hibbert as two of the top. Um, yeah, let's just say them two. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't followed a lot of um, N1 stuff, Kazim stuff. Uh, like programming stuff, but um, I'm sure it's good, you know. Uh, but those yeah. two, two are. I think I think in terms of how to periodize, in terms of like, here's the phases, here's the structure, here's the progression. <laughs> Kilo and Tommy, you guys. And one is where you go how to personalize periodization. So rather than having this phase is going to be three weeks, this is going to be four, this is going to be six, this is going to be ten. It's more like right. What are the signs and symptoms? push, 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 push with the body. The human is showing me to move phase. Where do you go? Yeah. That's yeah. what I found really, really good with Kilo. So for people who want to, again, and yourself, I've learned probably more from program design from you than I have done from you know, as much from you as any of these guys. So on that segue for people who want to learn more about you and what you do and maybe learn program Thank design you. from you, where are people are finding you. Stephen Collins training. I was just about to say that though, Sai. I was just about to give myself a plug. That's one thing I always do with my clients is is make sure we have a plan. But like, you know, some of my guys are moving into clusters, wave loading, these complex advanced strength power methods. And like, you know, they some of them are doing two-week phases. 
some of them do one yeah. week phases and then the three weeks and then they're out you know what i mean so depending on how they respond and how they build into it the loads that they're lifting the recovery and all that sort of stuff it's the individual you know what i mean some people can hit that for weeks and weeks and get away with it yeah some people two weeks they're done yeah exactly individual is very very important awesome yeah. awesome man oh i know Collins good, man. training mate Check enjoyed that out. cheers as always and i'll catch you next week pleasure take care